On the night of October 21st, 2016, Quentin Langford and some friends decided to celebrate homecoming weekend at an off-campus party in Tallahassee. At around 1.15 a.m., they left the party and were walking with a crowd of people when an argument broke out, resulting in gunshots. Quentin was not involved in the argument, but was struck by bullets and tragically died at the scene. Days later, police released surveillance footage of four individuals they believed were, quote, definitely involved in Quentin's murder. All four suspects were identified by police, however, no charges have ever been filed. It has been seven years since Quentin was killed, and investigators are still pursuing those responsible. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. Each week I'll be covering unsolved cases in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And on that note, if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you use. Okay, let's point out the obvious here. I don't know if you're hearing it, um, but I am definitely under the weather. Um, it's a bittersweet reason. I uh, went down to CrimeCon this past week, met a lot of you, um, and obviously with traveling this time of year, I caught something, definitely caught something. Doesn't appear to be COVID, but it's definitely something. And uh, frankly, I don't feel terrible, but my voice just sounds horrible. And, and the, the scary thing is that this is the best it sounded in a week. I, I was really struggling. In fact, we're recording this right now on a Friday. It's going to be out to you guys on a Monday morning. So Shannon's really uh, under the gun here, but I wanted to try to record something. This case is extremely fascinating and, and extremely frustrating at the same time. And uh, we had the pleasure of actually talking to Quentin's family, which we're going to get into in a little bit, uh, about this case. And I really wanted to get it out to you guys. So we're going to suck it up today. We're going to get it done. And uh, hopefully it's not too tough on your ears if you're listening on audio. And if you're watching on video, I, I always feel like it's a little easier to deal with the, the audio that may not be the best quality because you have some visual elements with it. Um, real quick about CrimeCon. Uh, went down there for Crime Weekly and Criminal Coffee. And I just want to say thank you. There were so many people there supporting Crime Weekly and Criminal Coffee. We had a line the entire weekend and we met thousands of you. And the words of encouragement were just incredible and they inspire us to do more and continue to grow as a channel. Uh, so thank you for that. I know you guys are, were thanking us for being there, but we, we really owe it to you guys because without you, we wouldn't be anywhere. And surprisingly, even though Detective Perspective is relatively new, a lot of you came up and said, love the new show. Love DP. Love what you're doing. Love that you're covering unsolved cases. And uh, it was surprising to me. It was surprising how many people said, hey, by the way, love your new show. And, and for someone who's just starting off, that means the world. And uh, I love the fact that most of you see what I'm trying to accomplish here. Uh, we're not necessarily covering the most clickbaity cases, which, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. We do that sometimes on Crime Weekly. But with detective perspective, I really wanted to focus on unsolved cases that are a little bit more obscure in most situations and need our attention, need to be put out there, need to be ex uh, have the exposure that some of these other cases get over and over again. So, again, final words on this. Thank you so much. As long as you'll have me. I'm going to keep doing it and I enjoy it and I, I enjoy meeting you guys and interacting and talking about these cases. So we're not going anywhere. We're going to keep it going. And uh, I owe a lot of that to you guys. So thank you. All right. So about Quentin's case, uh, this is one of those situations where you have suspects, but you just can't pin it down to the one specific person who committed the crime. And it's extremely frustrating. 
Uh, we had a similar situation in a case on breaking homicide, Cody Joyce out of uh, Pennsylvania. If you haven't seen that episode, go watch it. Really got pissed off in that one as well. This appears to be a similar situation. And we're going to talk about the specifics of this case and how we're getting to where we are and some of the frustrations that come from the investigative side of things where you might know who it is, but you don't have enough to prove it. And you can't go into court with just a blanket charge for three or four people and saying, hey, we know it's one of them. Is that enough? It's, it's never going to be, and it's going to get thrown out before it even gets started. So we have a lot to get into here. We have multiple sound bites from Quentin's family throughout this episode. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get into the case. Quentin Montana Langford was born on February 19th, 1996 to his parents, Alan and Tanya. He grew up in Florida alongside his sister, Deja, who was one year younger. While putting this episode together, we had the pleasure of speaking to Deja, as well as Quentin's grandmother, Diane, and his father, Alan. In 2001, when Quentin was five and Deja was four, their mother, Tanya, tragically passed away in a car accident. Afterward, the two young children went to live with Tanya's mother, Diane, who they loved dearly. And during this time, Quentin and Deja grew even closer. It was only us two from literally birth. We were just stuck, joined at the hip. We did everything together. So he had the biggest ask part. Anybody, anybody tell me he was great. He was just a really good person. Yeah, he had, I mean, he had a, like a smart mouth. He would make comments, but deep down, like once you got to know him, he would give you the shirt off his back. He put up a good front, like he was just so tough, but he was really just a teddy bear. He just, he would give you anything you ever asked for. Years after Tanya's passing, Quentin and Deja's younger brother, Sean, came to live with them at their grandparents' house. Quentin and Sean quickly became very close. By the time Quentin was a teenager, he enjoyed fixing cars, fishing, and spending time with his family, including his dad, Alan. They had a strong bond and often spent time with Alan's cousin, watching Miami Hurricanes football and engaging in friendly competitions. Alan told us that Quentin was highly competitive and they would compete even over the smallest things. Throwing the football around, like we would pick objects to hit to see who could hit them, who could throw it the furthest, who, it was just, no matter what it was, we was always competition about anything. Me, him, and my little cousin, JJ. But that's probably the best because we'd all three get it, see if we could throw the football through a tire, you know, a bunch of yards down the, you know, down the yard, but, you know, stuff like that. Quentin was not only a great competitor, but also exceptionally bright. Deja mentioned he always seemed to, quote, know too much, and he consistently excelled in school. He had a dream of going to college, which would have been the first in his family. However, Quentin initially thought that attending college might not be possible due to financial concerns. He contemplated joining the military to pay for college, but during his senior year of high school, his plans changed. After taking some tests, he discovered that he was eligible for scholarships and grants. Consequently, he made the difficult decision to quit the football team, which had been part of his life for years, and shifted his focus to his grades and applying for scholarships. Quinton's hard work paid off when he earned a full academic minority scholarship to Florida A&M University, also known as FAMU, which is a historically black college in Tallahassee. In the spring of 2014, he graduated with honors from Plant City High School. That fall, he started his first semester at FAMU, majoring in mechanical engineering. Deja, proud of her older brother, was heartbroken by his departure, even lying on the hood of his car to prevent him from driving away. At FAMU, Quinton remained focused on his studies. He loved his time there and became well-known and well-liked among his peers. According to the Dean and Director of Engineering Technology, quote, he got along with everybody. He was very friendly. Despite his demanding schedule at school, Quinton stayed in close contact with his family. He made sure to FaceTime Deja at least once a week and also reached out to the rest of his family, particularly his grandmother, Diane. He always stayed on the phone with her. I would be trying to call him. He's like, I'm on the phone with Nana. Give me a second. I'm like, well, I guess I'll have to schedule at a time. Quinton's primary motivation was to provide a secure future for his family. Deja told us, quote, his biggest goal was just coming home and being able to get a house big enough for his entire family to live on. So we never had to worry about that ever again. So it was something he was working toward. Quinton was so focused on his future that he got a tattoo on his chest that read, quote, success isn't measured by what you achieve. It's measured by the obstacles you overcome. Allen later told the Plant City Observer that Quinton lived by this motto. In the fall of 2016, Quinton began his third year at FAMU, 
living in an off-campus residence with his friend Lance. He held the position of president in FAMU's chapter of the Associated General Contractors of America and served as the membership chair for the National Society of Black Engineers. Quinton's future was looking brighter than ever. On the night of October 21st, Quinton, Lance, and some friends decided to celebrate homecoming weekend at an off-campus house party near Gamble Street and Perry Street in Tallahassee. At around 1.15 a.m., they left the party and were walking with a crowd of people when an argument broke out, leading to gunshots. According to WTXL, the argument involved two different groups within the larger crowd, and both groups fired shots at each other. At some point, someone yelled that, quote, they were from Duval County, which is around two hours away from Tallahassee. Both Quinton and Lance were hit by bullets fired during the argument. Tragically, Quinton did not survive despite medical personnel trying to save him. Lance, who got shot in the face, was rushed to Tallahassee Memorial Hospital in critical condition. He needed surgery and, although he survived, his nervous system suffered severe damage from the shooting. Now, when speaking with Alan, we asked if Lance recalled what led up to the fight. From my understanding, that it, it was an argument that started between the two other crowds. I mean, I get they were just, I guess, in the in the area, and I guess when they all walked past each other, I guess you know everybody was talking crap. And then, from my understanding, one of the crowds turned around and started shooting, and then somebody from the other side started shooting. So, and then that's how everything uh, went down. I mean, that's the way he explained it, and everybody else kind of explained it the same way. After the shooting, Quentin's aunt BJ received a call informing her about the murder. She then went to Deja's house and told her that Quentin had been shot. Deja believed Quentin might survive, as he once saved his uncle Harrison's life by applying pressure to a gunshot wound until help arrived. So I just immediately put on my clothes and was like, okay, well, let's, let's go. Like, let's just go to Tallahassee and we'll figure it out. And she was like, no, he's dead. And I just felt in that moment, like, everything drained from inside of me and I just was frozen. I didn't know what to say, how to react. And I was like, no, I didn't believe it. I just, you know, you're in a shock, a state of shock. You don't really know what's going on. And the first thing that I was like, I need to talk to my grandma and I need to talk to our younger brother. I had to send my aunt, her boyfriend to her house to go pick him up. And when he came, he just, as soon as he saw me, he just fell right to his knees. And it just, you know, it was very heartbreaking. And at that point, it was no longer about how I felt. I knew that I had to be there for the rest of the family because that's who Quentin was for everyone. If something traumatic or anything went wrong, he was the backbone. And then now that he was gone, it's just like, okay, well, whose turn is it now? So then it was just like, okay, it isn't about me. This is, you know, I have to be there for my grandma. I have to be there for everyone else. And it was just very, it was a very sad and dark time. And I'm sure for you as well, it was, it was very hard for her because she already had to bear, you know, in 2001, she buried her daughter, which was our mother, and that was her first kid, and now she has to bury her daughter's son, which I, she, we were her kids, like, we weren't looked at two grandkids, she raised us from four and five years old, so she felt like she was going through all of it again, and I'm sure that was very hard for her, and it's tough. All right, I want to take a quick second and pause in Quentin's case to talk about something that kind of goes back to what I was referring to earlier in this episode about CrimeCon. One thing I love about CrimeCon, in addition to meeting all of you, is meeting all the great podcasters out there. And one podcast in particular that I really like is Big Mad True Crime with Heather Ashley. Let me tell you a little bit about Big Mad True Crime. First off, the name, Big Mad. It's all about getting big mad over true crime. All the cases are done by listener request. There's no small talk. It gets right down to the facts. She's very straightforward, but very well researched. One of the things I love most about Heather and Big Mad True Crime is her passion for the victims and the families. That is the number one priority for Heather at all times. You can tell that by speaking to her off record and definitely in her episodes. As far as the episode itself, it's perfect for a commute. The episodes are usually under one hour. And in most cases, it's one case per episode, but she does sometimes do multiple parters. And I think, for example, she did the Christopher Watts case, which was multiple parts. But again, for the most part, if you're looking to get an entire story from start to finish in that one episode, you'll get that with Big Mad True Crime. Listen, I love supporting podcasts that make victims and their families a top priority. 
Heather and Big Mad True Crime is definitely one of those podcasts. So I strongly recommend you go check them out. A new episode drops every Monday on all podcast platforms. So go check them out. Big Mad True Crime with Heather Ashley. Okay, so let's get back into the episode. According to WTXL, right after the shooting, the police were waiting for witnesses to step forward and provide information to identify the shooter. They also interviewed many of the party attendees, which was reported to be somewhere in the hundreds. Uh, the police later said that not all witnesses were willing to cooperate. And I, I want to take a second to weigh in on that because, unfortunately, this is more common than you think, especially among younger people. Uh, there were many times where an incident took place, whether it was a shooting or assault in, in my jurisdiction, and there would be 50 to 100 people there that were all present during this encounter, whatever it was. Some of them would even have video footage of the crime on their phones, but, but they wouldn't come forward, or at least not immediately. And, and that's because of the stigma around, quote unquote, snitching to police. You don't see it as much with older people because, you know, we're more grown and we realize like, listen, at the end of the day, if people are going to be mad at you for telling the truth and helping someone out, they're probably not someone you want to be friends with anyways. But when, when you're younger and you want to be accepted by your peers, you don't want people to know that you're the person that can't be trusted. So the fear with law enforcement is that if you come forward and you help, that they will expose you to everyone, that you were the person who helped them solve the case. And I spent a lot of time reaffirming to, to individuals that if they wanted to remain confidential, they could provide information and we could put protections in place so that it would be highly likely that their names and information would not be exposed to the public. Although I have to give them the benefit there where it's like, how do you know? How do you know that's really going to happen? How do you know that investigators, for the sake of the case, aren't going to put your name out there just in order to get the arrest? And the truth is that has happened before where someone has been burned whether it's a confidential witness or a confidential informant, those are two different things, by the way, where they, they trust the officer and the officer is blinded by the overall investigation and burns their witness or informant in the process. So the one thing that I would always tell my officers and one thing that I always did, regardless of how significant the case was, I would do whatever I could to protect that witness all the way up till trial I even had a case where, in, as a narcotics detective, where we had a confidential informant. And in most instances, the judge will not make you reveal that informant. Uh, but in this particular case, based on the arguments that were being made, the judge said basically, hey, we need to know who it is. And I knew that the only reason the defendant wanted to know is because they were going to kill this person if they found out who it was. So I took a a, a little short recess with, with the attorneys representing uh, the state. And ultimately we decided to drop the case. And that was because I knew this was bigger than just this investigation. Not only would I be putting this informant's life in jeopardy, but word would get around on the streets where I worked that Derek was not someone who could be trusted. This would follow me for the rest of my career if I had chosen to do that. So for the, for the betterment of the community and the, and the cases that were going to come in the future, knowing that this was a narcotics case and there wasn't a specific victim, the real victim was the community, I decided to lose the battle to win the war, if you will, and uh, we dropped the case. And I will tell you, word did get around about my willingness to lose the entire case, to lose the entire investigation for this person. And to this day, I've never revealed who that person was, and I do think that decision was a big reason why I had so much success when it came to getting information from community members in the future after that case. So just something to keep in mind if you're in your community, you can ask around about certain investigators. They will get reputations. And if you have something that could help solve a case, really consider doing so because for the most part, if those investigators promise you uh, protection, they will do everything in their power to make sure that happens. Now, on October 26, four days after the shooting, the Tallahassee Police Department released surveillance footage from the Gamble and Perry Street area at 1.19 a.m. on October 22, four minutes after the estimated time of the shooting. The footage showed three men and one woman, but the police only provided descriptions for two of them. 
The woman was described as being 18 to 24, with long hair down to her mid-back, wearing white shorts, a light-colored shirt, and holding a clutch purse or bag. One of the men was described as, quote, heavy set with, quote, twists in his hair, wearing a tank top under a light-colored open button-down shirt, along with darker pants. In the footage, the group left the crime scene, walked past a FAMU village dorm, and got into four separate cars. They then left the parking garage on Wanish Way. The police identified the cars as a gray Toyota Camry or Corolla, a dark-colored Chrysler 200, a white Chevy Impala with black rims and silver hubcaps, and a greenish Nissan Altima with front bumper damage. The police also shared a still image of the suspects from the video, hoping that someone would recognize them and provide more information about the shooting or the suspects. They emphasized that the individuals in the still image were, quote, definitely involved in the shooting. Additionally, the police revealed that they had video of the actual shooting, however, they would not be releasing it. They also know the exact location of the shooting, but would not disclose it, just in case the information that came forward would help narrow down the suspects. Days later, the police informed the Tallahassee Democrat that the release of the still image had generated several tips about the shooting, but none of them had led to any arrests. A week after Quinton passed away, FAMU's Division of Engineering Technology announced a scholarship in his honor. This scholarship would be awarded to students from diverse backgrounds and underrepresented minorities. Deja later shared with WFTS Tampa Bay, quote, he made himself into something. He might not have finished FAMU, but we're definitely going to proceed to follow his dreams for him. Now, Quinton's roommate, Lance, was in the hospital recovering from his injuries. Allen told the FAMUN that he formed a connection with Lance after the shooting. They spoke once or twice a week in the months that followed. Allen said, quote, I make sure to stay in contact with him all the time to make sure he's doing okay. Now, side note here, we asked Alan if he knows whether Lance spoke to the police about what he witnessed that night before the shooting. Alan is unsure if that occurred or not. Unfortunately, within a few weeks of Quentin's murder, his case faded from the media. However, the pain his family felt remained as intense as the day they received the heartbreaking news. They mourned Quentin deeply, cherishing memories of his smile, his FaceTime calls, and his good-natured spirit. He was such a, like, a, just a, a kind, good soul, you know, like, you know, for his birthday, it would always say, you know, you, you pick where you want to go, and, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. And he'd always pick the Olive Garden at all places. But, you know, I asked him one day, I'm like, you know, why do you always pick the Olive Garden, you know, go to a steakhouse and do whatever? And he's like, because, you know, it's cheap and it's, it's pretty good. And it's that like, way well, everybody ain't got to spend a lot of money on. So he's always just, just kind and good hearted. In March of 2017, five months after Quentin's murder, the Famuin newspaper reported the police were still looking for Quentin's killer. They didn't have any significant leads or updates. In an effort to generate more leads, Quentin's family sought media attention for his case and advertised an $8,000 reward for information. Deja informed us that Lance's family also hired a private detective to investigate the shooting, but no new leads emerged from that. The case remained unsolved and the investigation stalled. In 2020, the police received new technical and lab analysis information, though they have not shared these details with the public. Therefore, it remains unclear what this information entails. When we asked the family if they had any insight, they were unaware of any developments as the police have not been very open with them. Now to weigh in here, and I've weighed in on it before, this is relatively a new case. I don't wanna sound like a broken record, but as, the, as investigators develop new information, new leads, they may not divulge that information right away because they're still trying to find someone who has guilt knowledge about the case. So if that if they're going to charge them, they can use that as part of their arrest affidavit. If they put everything out to the public, everything they have out on the table for everyone, the first thing that's going to come into question when this goes to trial by the defense is that anything that was relayed to them was already public knowledge. So everything that becomes critical in their case maybe just dismissed by a jury because they're going to say, hey, anybody with a phone or a computer would have had access to this information. So I understand what they're doing here. It's not always the case. Sometimes it's just um, bad police practice, the way they deal with these families. But in this particular case, it may be a combination where it may not be the most forthright department, but also they're trying to protect the integrity of the investigation. By 2021, WTXL reported that the police knew the names of the four individuals captured in the surveillance footage. However, they refrained from disclosing these names or providing further information. 
Allen did express his frustration with how long the police are taking to work on Quentin's case. He said, quote, I guess stuff not happening fast enough gives me a bad taste in my mouth. I wanted this done like four years ago. Allen told us more information about his frustrations with the police. When I talk to him, you know, here and there, it, it's always the same thing. It's, it's an open case. We're still looking to it, blah, blah, blah. That's pretty much as far as that goes. It gets to a point where you just get tired of calling them because it's the same answer over and over and over. I just want them to do their job and solve the case and, you know, let's put it to rest and move on. Yeah, so this just kind of goes back to what I just said, right? The police are always going to give that blanket statement. Sorry, it's an open investigation. We can't tell you much more than that. And I can tell you firsthand, I've had many conversations like this where the people on the other end of the phone call or the other, you know, on the under, other end of this conversation are very frustrated by my response. And, and all I can say is in most cases, we're human beings and we want to give you more closure. But unfortunately, for, again, for the integrity of the investigation, sometimes we just can't at that moment. But you have to understand that in most situations, we want the same thing you want. We want justice and accountability for what happened to your loved one. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we work together. Deja was also frustrated because the police know the identities of the four people involved in Quentin's murder, but have not taken any action. Now, according to Deja, the police have even shared the names of two of the individuals from the video with the family, the woman and one of the men who happened to be her boyfriend. Deja told us she has never disclosed these names before. However, it has been seven years since Quentin's murder, and she feels the police have done nothing with the information. Consequently, she decided to share it with us because she doesn't know what else to do. Now, in a moment, I will be playing a series of audio clips from Deja, and in these clips, she mentions the two alleged suspects, but I will be censoring their names for a variety of reasons. First off, as I said earlier, we all want the same thing. I want justice for Quentin. I want some answers for Quentin's family, for Deja, for Alan, for all of them. And my number one goal with this show is to get exposure, get new eyes, get new ears on this case. And as a detective in good conscience, although we do get frustrated sometimes, seven years is relatively new when it comes to cold cases. This isn't even a cold case as far as I'm concerned. And what I could not forgive myself for is if in that moment I released these names and somehow it hurt the investigation going forward. We all want the same thing. I will do whatever I can to support Quentin's family, but I have to put my professional hat on here and do what I think is right, not only for them, but, but for this case. So due to those reasons, I will refer to the two alleged suspects that Deja mentioned as Brandon and Sierra. According to Deja, multiple witnesses informed the police that Brandon might be responsible for the shooting. Quentin and Brandon were not friends, but they likely crossed paths at FAMU as they were both students. Now, after surviving the shooting, Lance coincidentally encountered Brandon on campus. I talked to Lance, which is the other kid who was also um, involved, and he said that when they told him that he went back into, because he was going to drop out and he was going to go home with his family and he wasn't going to like continue at FAMU. But then he was like, you know what? I'm just going to face my fears and do it. So he went back into the administrative administrative office and he's seen <laughs> sitting in there as well trying to re-enroll. He said when he ran across him, like they just looked at each other and he's like, <laughs> just looked like he saw a ghost. And he got up and walked out and ever since then, they haven't seen him. Deja explained that she's uncertain why Brandon would allegedly shoot Quentin, but she has a theory. During a candlelight vigil for Quentin, one of his friends who was with him and Lance the night of the party mentioned that Quentin had flirted with the girl they encountered after the party. When she rejected him, Quentin made a sarcastic comment. Deja speculates that Sierra might have been the girl Quentin flirted with. She wonders whether Sierra informed her boyfriend Brandon about Quentin's comment leading to the shooting. It's just hard to believe that it was the wrong place, wrong yeah. time. Because there was a video release that, that was actually sent to me after his funeral of Lance and Quinn laying on the ground. And people are just walking over him. They're just recording him instead of helping. So just from that, it just goes to show that I don't feel like it was very random. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense on how it could be so random, but you only hit two people. And I was like, oh, there was a party across the street. Okay, well, then someone else could have got grazed at least, you know, something. And it just doesn't, it doesn't sit right with anyone. 
that it was just wrong place, wrong time. And to know yeah. Quinn is just to know that like he's not he's not problematic. Like if there's no. an issue or there's some type of you know what we call beasts, he's just like dude yeah. ain't got nothing to do with me and he walk away. So I feel like you know unfortunately most people nowadays they're very angry and so when someone's just trying to walk away it's like oh no you know we're gonna have an issue so now i don't know who shot quentin langford but i do know that brandon frequently discussed shooting people on social media and even rapped about it under the rap name that included the word shots court records further reveal that in 2017 brandon faced multiple gun charges once he was arrested for smoking weed with a loaded gun under his seat but those charges were dropped. Another time, less than a year later after Quentin's death, he pointed a gun at two people at a gas station and threatened to kill them. He was convicted of that offense and served more than a year in prison. Later, in January of 2018, Brandon released a rap video where he mentioned being questioned about a murder. Deja believes he may be referring to Quentin's murder. Now, I'm not gonna play the video here, I'm not gonna give it any more light, but I will talk you through it. The video opens with Brandon standing outside of a studio talking on the phone. A detective approaches him and tells him he needs to come to the police station to be questioned about a murder. Brandon resists arrest but is ultimately taken to the station for an interrogation. The detective questions Brandon about where he was the night of the murder and Brandon replies that he doesn't know. The detective mentions that others provided a similar response. He then informs Brandon that his name has come up in connection with the murder. Brandon laughs at the detective and denies any involvement in the shooting. The detective hands him some paperwork and tells him he'll be facing a life sentence. Brandon continues to laugh and says that he has a quote rebuttal, then he starts rapping. Brandon raps that he'll always keep things quote confidential and won't snitch on anyone. He mentions that people have accused him and his friends of being killers, but they can't be arrested because there's no reliable witnesses. He continues rapping, at one point saying quote, I keep talking to bitches and they the reason you gonna be missing. Fill him up with holes, now he's a sponge. He later raps, quote, he barely can speak, gasping for air, breathing like he got the hiccups, and now he playing victim cause I already had my stick up. At another point he raps, quote, step on a bitch like a marching band, and I heard on the streets I'm worth like a couple bands. Now bands, he's, he's obviously most likely referring to money, basically saying his stock is up right now. It's a common term, I, I'm sure most of you have heard it, bands are, means a lot of money. And now obviously Deja informed us that she found Brandon's video ironic and not at all coincidental. And I don't necessarily disagree, but there could be two reasons behind it, right? If he's the guy, well, then obviously he's indirectly claiming this murder, knowing that nothing's going to come of it. It could also be a situation where he knows that he's being connected to this murder and he's using it as a rapper to gain some level of street credibility, some clout off of it, even though he may know he's not responsible or one of his, you know, co-conspirators did it and he's never going to snitch on them. Either way, he's capitalizing on Quentin's murder. There's, there's no doubt about it, in, in my opinion. Deja also mentioned that the police attempted to speak with Sierra, Brandon's girlfriend at the time, but were unsuccessful. Deja believes that Sierra was afraid of Brandon and that's why she wouldn't turn on him. They also told us that she was, she was scared of him because yeah. I guess there was like domestic violence and whatever else involved. So she didn't want to get involved any further just because she didn't, because they're not, from what we understand, that they're not together any, any longer. But she was just scared of what he could do to her. So he, she didn't want to talk about it. Now, I can't confirm whether Brandon abused Sierra or not. However, I will say that court records indicate that Brandon had a history of domestic violence with charges in Duval County in June of 2021 and January of 2023. Now, unfortunately, while putting this episode together, Deja learned that Brandon died in the summer of 2023. And although he's no longer with us, the individuals who were allegedly with him on the night of the murder are still alive and, and they may have information about what occurred. So it's crucial for them to come forward and, and help resolve this situation, not only for Quentin, but, but for his family. If someone knows something, anything, something that might seem small to them, just come forward, just let us know, like, you don't have to go to the police. The Justice for Q page is there for that reason, to be anonymous if you were not, it's not like we're gonna put your name or drag you through it. We just want to know more about that night. We don't know what happened and we wanna know. So anything that seems you know, small, it could be small, it could be big. Just, I feel like coming forward and sharing your information with us, so 
just be a relief to us. Now, as you can imagine, Deja said not knowing what happened to Quentin is really difficult for all of them. Even though it's been a long time, it's still hard for majority of like my grandmother and everyone else to kind of talk about it and be able to digest it. They just don't really, they still are very uneasy and no one really knows what's going on. So, and especially without answers, it's kind of hard. You know, people just want, they just want answers. They want to know something. And as far as now, we really, like I said, the information that we have now is stuff that we gather from students and the police, you know, investigators and stuff like that. But it's kind of work that we've done on our own. It's not with the help from people who should be helping. Yeah, he's just, he just deserves more than yeah, what he, he was given. Just... Yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't a terrible person. He, you know, he was a, just a good person all around. He didn't, never went to jail, never had any trouble with, you know, Everybody anything. Yeah, he was just a good person, a good hearted person. And whoever, if really did do that, I just want to know why. And was it just an accident or did you meet, you know, just answers is all that we're looking for and to know something. And I think the biggest thing for me is just to kind of finally put my grandma's mind at ease because it does weigh on her fairly heavy. You know, she's still, it's like I said, it's been seven years almost and she doesn't sleep at night. She always is just worried. It's hard for her to even let, you know, she texts, she'll send a text like, oh, what are you doing? I had a bad dream. Like, she, you know, she's worried about all now her other grandkids and it's not fair. So I feel like if we're able to put her mind at ease and let her know, like, you know, he's away, gone, then it'd be easy for her to, easier. It's not going to ever go away, but it will just be a relief that, you know, she brought justice for her grandson. Unfortunately, we don't have any other updates in this case. And today, Quentin's family remains very unhappy with the police department's handling of the investigation. Notably, the lead detective has stopped answering or returning their calls. And as a side note, I personally attempted to reach out to the lead detective multiple times, but never received a call back. All right, so that brings us to my perspective, and it's going to be a short one tonight, and I think you guys all know why. This isn't a real question of what happened to Quentin. We know he was shot, and we know the suspect pool is only a few people. Do I think the other individuals that were in that, that footage uh, are going to come forward? Probably not. And the reasons why may be because they helped uh, destroy or some evidence in, in around the case, and they're worried about catching a charge for conspiracy, although if by chance one of them are watching or listening to this, I assure you, if you're not the person who pulled the trigger, there may be something that can be done there. So don't let that be a hesitancy for you. Specifically, I'm speaking to Sierra. If you're listening or watching this, uh, you need to come forward. Uh, if Brandon's responsible for this, you've heard this case now. You've heard directly from Quentin's family. Do the right thing. I don't believe, based on what I've learned about this case, that you pulled the trigger. Uh, and if that's the truth, remember what I said at the top of this episode, something can be done where you can provide information that could help close this case while also making sure we do what we can to protect you. And if it was Brandon who pulled the trigger, he's no longer with us. So what's, what's stopping you at this point? But now let's say Sierra and the other individuals don't come forward. Well, as I said earlier, there were other people present during the shooting. And there's no doubt in my mind that there are other people who saw whoever did this, shoot Quentin. And for some reason, they haven't come forward yet. It's been, it's been a while. You've moved on from college. You've gone on with your life, and you may be thinking, it's not my problem anymore. And I hope that if you're listening or watching, you hear the words from Deja and from Alan, you hear the frustration, and you think about this being your sister, your brother, your daughter, your son, and how it would affect you knowing that there are people out there today that could change the, the entire trajectory of this case. I want you to really take a second and put yourself in their shoes. And then finally, I want to talk directly to the police department, the Tallahassee Police Department handling this case. I'm one of you guys. I've been there before. I know what you're dealing with. And it sounds like a situation where it's a matter of two or three people who pulled the trigger and you just can't pinpoint to that, to that specific person. And maybe some of the new information you have may help you in doing that. But I don't think the correct response or action if you are working on something behind the scenes is to not 
stay in contact with the family members. So the same thing that I just said to potential witnesses, I'm going to say to you too. Imagine this is your sister, your brother, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father. Treat it like that. This is not just a case to them. Although you may have hundreds of investigations, you have to understand that each and every one of these cases involve real people with real families who have to live with this every day. When you go home on Friday and you go hang out with your friends and family, they're still thinking about it. So take five minutes of your day, call them back, email them back, let them know that you're, you still care and that you're still working on it and that if there's an update, you will be in contact. You don't know how much that would mean to them. And finally, I want to thank Quentin's family, specifically Deja and Alan, for coming forward and, and, and adding and contributing to this episode. I really do feel like it adds so many layers to the investigation for our listeners and our viewers to hear directly from you. I know it's not easy to do, so thank you for your courage in coming forward and continuing to tell Quentin's story. And I can tell you firsthand from reading the comments on these episodes that I know anybody here watching or listening to this episode will continue to support you until we get answers for Quentin and the rest of your family. However, if there's anybody out there, anybody at all who was involved that night or who has heard information after the fact, uh, please, if you have any information, come forward and call Crime Stoppers at 850-574-TIPS. There is a $10,000 reward for information, and if you'd like to support the family, you can join the Facebook group, Justice for Q, and you can share this episode. Listen, I'll leave you with this. Someone out there knows something, and we need to reach them. You can help in that. Everyone stay safe out there. I'll see you next week. Thank you.